Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. On today's episode, episode number 22, we are going to be giving our top 10 point guard rankings going into next season. So based on not just last season, based on their their entire body of work, but looking specifically at how we're going to rank these guys going into the 2023-2024 NBA season. Start off every episode as we always do. How are we doing today, Dick Dame? I am doing great, my brother. I am doing great. I'm excited. Let's talk about these point guards, man. Talk about these point guards. I'm I'm excited to see the differences in our list. I feel like I try my best not to look at yours. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm excited to see the differences in our list. Yeah, I feel like when we go through and rank all these positions, as I was thinking about it, point guard is still one of the only positions I feel like actually probably the position that is still solidified the most like most teams have a specific point guard that always plays point guard Mm -hmm. and then like two through four you have people that used to be shooting guards that sometimes are playing the three sometimes right the four people are playing the four play the three people play the four play the five like everything else has gotten mixed up but this point guard list like across the league everybody that's a point guard been a point guard their whole career Mm -hmm. they always are playing the one um And I feel like outside of the top two guys, maybe, like, it's debates, arguments to be made for every other person all the way throughout the list. Um, so I am really interested to see how we go through this all. Um, I'm going to get the housekeeping out of the way. If you are watching on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on audio platforms, Apple Music, Spotify, go ahead and pre-download the show. Uh, leave a, a rating and drop us a five-star rating as well and leave a review um, on, the, on the podcast there as well. Um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get right into the top 10 rankings um, here. Um, you can go first because I have a lot to say actually about my number 10 <laughs> spot because it was very, very difficult for me to come to a selection. I honestly might flip while you're, you're giving your 10 slot. So <laughs> go ahead and, and start at number 10. All right. Um. So, my tenth best point guard going into next season, Stephen Curry. Now, let me yo, start playing. <laughs> you imagine that though, man? I was just like, yo, I just think he's gonna take a crazy drop off. You know, that age is gonna hit. But nah. I, all jokes aside, um, my tenth best point guard in the NBA going into next season is actually Jalen Brunson. Okay. Um, I'm a big Jalen Brunson fan. So honestly, when I was making this list, I really wanted to find a way to put him higher, but. If we're looking at projection, like going into next season, the only reason why I'm having 10 and have some guys who probably right now, it's a case to be made that, that, that they're not better than him right now, but just going into next season, I think that they probably will be, is because Jalen Brunson, I feel like he's not hit his ceiling, but like how much better can he really get? You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. a lot of these other guys on this list I have, I feel like they still have room to improve and they still have room to grow. And I think that next year they'll take that that um that step forward basically in that direction i just think jalen brunson he had a great season um should have made the all-star team i don't know how he didn't make the all-star team i don't know how his teammate made it ahead of him he should have been the, the nick on the all-star team but um in my head he's an all-star caliber player um he had a great playoffs you know had i think it was two he had two 40 point games or a 40 and 30 point game two 40 point games yeah two 40 pieces yeah yeah played every minute of those games um against that team that ended up going to the finals so Obviously, big playoff performer. Um, he's he's a really good player. I really, honestly, I really, really wish I could put him higher. But for me, he's number ten. Okay, Brunson is a guy that I have considered for his ten spot. Um, and I'm just lay it out here, right? So I really have three guys here for this ten spot, and those three guys are Drew Holiday, Jalen Brunson, and Jamal Murray, and. Again, when I'm thinking about looking into next year, right, Drew Holiday obviously coming off of an all-star season, um, put up very good stats last year, um, you know, in terms of points. I think it might have been his second or third highest uh, points per game season in his career, put up a little over 19 a night, um, almost seven and a half assists, five rebounds. We know what the defense is. Like, if you listen to any NBA players talk in terms of who's the most underrated player in the NBA, 
who's the best defender in the NBA, Drew Holiday's name is brought up probably more than anybody else. And it's a pretty big gap from what I've heard. Um, and, and you can see, right, if you watch the games, you know that he's always going to take on the best perimeter defender. He's a menace in the pick and roll in terms of just being able to play very physical, uh, disrupt your timing, disrupt your rhythm, your flow, um, all while not fouling very, like, very disciplined. Like, I really wanted to find a way to get him on this list because I think he is he is underrated. And I don't know how he'll ever be properly rated. But when I think about going into next season, Chris Milton is back and healthy. So we'll probably see his offensive role diminish a little bit more. Um, which, honestly, even when Chris was there, like, he was putting still putting up you know, 18 a night. So, like, we're not looking at a huge difference in terms of point-per-game drop-off. People were making um, the case that he was the second-best player, he, that he is just the second-best player in Milwaukee. I think there's a real, like, a real avenue for that being the case <clears throat> moving forward. Like, it was Chris and Giannis, and mm-hmm. then Drew kind of being the third option there. But this is common, like... I mean, like, not really a prove it year. Like, he's already on contract and everything, got the extension. But, like, mm-hmm. I need to see something from Chris Middleton. Yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, he's dealt with the injuries. But even when he came back last year, did not look like the Chris Middleton we were used to seeing. Definitely struggled a lot offensively. Um, so, I'm more confident right now in Drew Holiday's offense and Chris Middleton's offense to being the second fiddle to, to Giannis. Um, and so that is why I have Drew Holiday considered for this spot. Brunson really for all the same reasons that you just gave, obviously, um, on top of the fact that that heat playoff series sticks so much, sticks out so much in my mind because in game, what he played like what, 44 minutes or something in game five, like almost didn't come out the game. Mm-hmm. And then did it again in Game Six and dropped forty-one with no help at all. Yeah, that was that was a backpack effort right there. Right, <clears throat> and like and hadn't really turned the ball over all game and just unfortunately had the turnover that ended up losing them the game. Right, but played almost a flawless game in Game Six, trying to force a Game Seven um, against the eventual Eastern Conference champions um, in the Miami Heat. And I think that you mentioned his ceiling. Like, I don't know how much better he can get. Um, And I agree to an extent. I think it really, I feel like, all depends on Julius Randle. Like, what is his role in this offense moving forward? Is he going to be with the Knicks moving forward for a longer period of time? Um, obviously there's been trade rumors, um, about really any disgruntled star trying to make their way to the Knicks, probably Embiid and and Dame are both the the two that are most linked there right now in terms of just wild media rumors. But, um, like this being his first season, like being able to be, and he's like, you could, you could almost make the argument that he's not the number one option in New York, like. Him and yeah. Julius Randle kind of were tit for tat some nights. I mean, come playoff time though, he's that he's number one at come. Well, yeah, because we know what Julius Randle does <laughs> come yeah. playoff time. Exactly, yeah, he's the number one come play, come playoff time. It's uh, I don't know, it's just tough because like I, all right. So you're saying like if Julius Randle gets traded and he's the number one over there, like the clear cut number one, or if Julius Randle gets traded and they get like a say like they get like a disgruntled like Embiid or something like that. Like, or I'm even saying, even if Julius Randle stays, but, like, Thibodeau sits him down and is like, hey, I need you to, like, find your flow mm-hmm. off of him, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Um, and really try to turn the keys over there to, to Brunson. Um, and I don't know if that's going to drastically, like, if he's not, I don't think Brunson is going to turn into this, like, overnight 32-point per game right. score. <laughs> but, I mean... Yeah, I, I think it's going to come down to a lot of that, like how him and Randall continue to coexist, um, what that shot diet for Julius Randall looks like. Um, so, I, like I said, I don't know exactly how much 
greater his ceiling is going to be. And if it doesn't get much higher than this, like 24 and six, you know, whatever he might put up 25, 26 and seven and eight assists, like those are all star numbers year in, year out from a point guard. So it's like, it doesn't necessarily need to get, you know, a ton higher. Mm -hmm. Um, So Brunson is another person I consider then obviously Jamal Murray, who I have sitting at the 10 spot here in my top 10. And I'm contemplating switching it around, but I do think I'm going to leave it there. And it's for this reason. This was uh, Jamal Murray season coming off of the ACL tear. Um, you know, his regular season, he kind of started to get his legs under him. He did, you know, play and start 65 games from a counting stats perspective, put up 20 a night, you know, six, six assists, four rebounds. Um, and then let me see if I can find his playoff stats. Um, okay. I, from this playoff run point per game totals, he put up 27 against Minnesota, 27 a night against Minnesota, 25 against Phoenix, 32 a night against the Lakers, and then average 21 and 10 in the finals against Miami's defense who had given everybody else problems the entire playoff run. Mm -hmm. And what that showed me is that a, he's got his confidence back in terms of his, like just being himself as a player, but also with the knee injury, I think he's fully comfortable and recovered from that. And now obviously he's got the, this big playoff run under his belt. He's got the championship under his belt we already kind of knew him to be a playoff riser he did that again for a full playoff run this is a season where i think if a few things fall his way maybe like an injury job morant suspension might aid in this like he probably can get an all-star nod this year um i think it's all-star lock just off of the fact that they're coming off a championship and the way people are going to vote like he mm -hmm. they're going to give him an all-star because they're like how how has this guy not made it now? Just because his name is out there, I feel like he's allowed to make it. I only say no because the guard room in the West is so deep. Like point guards alone, you're looking at like Steph, Luca, Dame, Shea, Ja, De'Aaron ja, Fox. Ja's not gonna make it. Uh, that's true. But De'Aaron Fox, and then if you go to guard, like shooting guards too, Devin Booker as well. <clears> like <throat> mm -hmm. it's gonna be tough just for any of them to make it like there's only so many spots open mm -hmm. um but yeah i am going to keep jamal there and a lot of that is going to be based off of the fact that i think that he's going to ride this momentum coming off of this finals run come off the championship um the confidence that he got from that and the confidence that he got from being able to do that one year removed from the acl injury i think this next season is going to be the best of jamal murray's career He's obviously gets to benefit from playing with the best player in basketball right now. Their two man game looked unstoppable all playoff, all season long, really, but really right. all playoff long. Um, and you know they they really only lose what uh, Bruce, Brown, Bruce Brown, but I, I do think Christian Braun can slot in pretty nicely to that spot and kind of fill a lot of those same roles that Bruce Brown did. So like this team is going to look very similar to last year. And I think we see a year where, you know, Jamal Murray comes out and potentially puts up like 25 points a night. And, you know, the assist numbers, I'm not sure like so much of that is going to be on Jokic's shoulders, but he put up six, you know, a game last season, six, seven assists. Like, again, those are all-star numbers. Um, and obviously Denver is going to be one of the top teams in the West. So all of that considered, I'm going to give Jamal Murray the nod here at 10, but just know it's very, very close with Jalen and Drew Holiday. Like that's like 10 B and 10 C. I can't even split them up that far. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I actually have uh, Jamal Murray a little bit higher than, than 10. So I, I agree. With, I agree with pretty much everything you said. Um, my number nine spot, sorry, I'm trying to pull up his stats real quick. I had it up. I don't know why it went away. But my number nine spot is actually Darius Garland. Um, okay. And he was one of those guys where between him and Brunson, 
I was making the case that like I don't know how much better Jalen Brunson can get, but with Darius Garland, I still feel like he has room to get a lot better. Basically, I still feel like he has room to improve. Because mm-hmm. think about it, he went from a season two years ago when they made the play in, and that was their first real like any meaningful playoff slash play-in game experience. And then they go from that, obviously, they get Donovan Mitchell, and then they go into the playoffs this year. Yes, they had a disappointing first-round exit, but he's had some games where he showed he, he showed out. Like, he showed up, but he also had some games where he kind of was a little bit of a no-show, you know what I mean? But I think mm-hmm. a lot of that comes from inexperience, him being right. so young, um, first time in the playoffs, you know what I mean? So I feel like now having that under your belt, you still are – uh, alongside Donovan Mitchell. You still have Evan Mobley, who's going to improve and get a lot better. I just think that he's in a position to where his numbers his numbers can improve. I feel like the team's success can get a lot better. I feel like they could, I feel like they could build off of last year, even though I know it was disappointing. I still feel like the Cavs are going to be one of those, maybe not like top-tier contenders in the East, but I feel like they're one of the, one of the better teams in the East, I should mm-hmm. say. And... Who knows? I mean, if you get better performances from Darius Garland, you get more consistent performances from Donovan Mitchell in the playoffs. I, I feel like Donovan Mitchell's number. No, sorry, not Donovan Mitchell. I feel like Darius Garland's numbers, it could be better going into the next season. I think that he could take that leap forward. So I, I think that's why I have my number nine over a guy like Jalen Brunson. I, I have Garland at nine, too, again, for most of the same reasons that you said. Um, I think he proved in many games last year that. Not only can him and Donovan Mitchell coexist so well together, but they both, I think, did a really good job at playing off of each other and understanding mm-hmm. when one person had it going, the other person was able to kind of take that back seat, right. but not be disengaged from the offense. Like, still there, still effective, um, but you understand, like, you know, Donovan Mitchell just put up 24 in the first half. Like, it's mm-hmm. his night. Or right. Garland's got it going. Like, now Donovan Mitchell's playing more off ball. Um, and I think like gr- the growth for him will come more kind of like, again, with their team, like mobily getting better. And like you said, the inexperience in the playoffs, like, I think that they'll grow from how they, you know, they perform that first round series against the Knicks. Um, and so I expect, I expect them to honestly be like a top four or five seed in the East this year and I expect them to make some actual noise in the playoffs like at least get to the second round and push a team you know Mm -hmm. like the Celtics or the Sixers if they keep you know Harden or whatever um you know to a a hard six or seven game series or potentially like some falls their way and they make the Eastern Conference Finals do what Um, they're supposed to do this year right because I think talent wise like they're there. Like, they are there. I think they still have the the, the questions at the, the three spot, but they bring back Karis LeVert. He looked good in, you know, spurts for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe they can figure that out because I feel like that was just, like, the missing thing that they needed is one more wing who could defend and shoot. Right. Um, and I think Mobley, again, like, the defense is there. I, I I liked what I saw from him on the offensive end, um, growing from year one to year two. I'm excited to see that growth again um, coming into this season. So I think from DG, just like it continues to just be like, not to say that his growth is capped by playing with Donovan Mitchell, but again, he's going to be the the Robin on most nights. Mm -hmm. But like I said, part of why I think he's so good is that he's still clearly has the ability to take over these games whenever that opportunity arises. And that's not something you could say about a lot of the second fiddles or Robins across the the league. Like on most nights, they're always going to be that. But there's a good chunk of games last year where like Darius Garland just got it going. And it was like, it's his show right now, not right. Donovan Mitchell's. Mm-hmm. Um, and so – realistically like the reasons why i have some of the other people in front of him that i do um is that a lot of them are the number one options other teams um and are very effective um or just their their playmaking i think is kind of on an, another level from him but um yeah i have him at nine two um and honestly like it, he's one of my favorite 
point guards to watch in the league. Like his handle, like I think there's a workout video that came out from him recently. And just like his muscle memory to do some of these moves is like, bro, his handle is tight. It's on a string. The shot making is crazy. Him and Donovan Mitchell, like probably one of the toughest shot making backcourts in the league. So mm, his bag I'm is crazy. I'm excited for the Cavs this year. I'm expecting like a very I'm expecting a good regular season, but really I'm expecting them to make a deep playoff run because I think the talent is there. They got, you know, they're like first ex- taste of the playoffs last year now they understand donovan mitchell i'm sure is in their ear like obviously haven't had the deeper playoff runs like look this is what it takes mm-hmm. jared allen said the, li- the lights were too bright so hopefully he, his eyes will adjust now <laughs> um and they can they can really do something next year yeah 100 percent um so that was nine i mm-hmm. eight i have that's where i have jamal murray at okay. um i just feel like so Honestly, the the lower part of my list is really where the number twos are at and like the top one to six ish players for me um, are where like you have the number one player, no one options on their team. Most of these guys are number one options on their team. And Jamal Murray, you pretty much everything you said, you talked about it. The fact that he was such a big playoff riser. um, And it's like. It's not like this is his first time doing it either. I remember when we were doing that. Remember when we were ranking, I think, four players, and it was like Jamal Murray, Pascal Siakam, Jalen Brown, and I think it was B.I. or B. I. something like yeah. that. And I put Jamal Murray first, and people were looking at me like, oh, my God, it's so recency bias. Like, no, bro, he – people forget what he did in 2020, or they remember it, but it, because it was the bubble, the bubble it yes. didn't count. So, like, Jamal Murray's not a real playoff riser because it was the bubble. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually glad he went on this playoff run to prove to people, like, no – He's actually a really good basketball player. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was just the fact that, bro, he got injured. Right. He literally got hurt, and then he had to work his way back from the injury. So it's like you can't fault him for that. But when we seen him, when we seen him healthy, and when we seen him alongside Jokic, he's been arguably the best second option in the league, but I've definitely one of the best second options alongside Jokic. So, yeah, yeah ama- amazing playoff riser. I-, I feel like he has a good chance to make the All-Star game. I know it is going to be tough with the guards that are in the West, but I think just having coming off this championship run, him never making an All-Star game, I just think people will, will do right by him and vote him in for his first ever All-Star appearance. So I think he has a good chance to make it, and I think he'll have a solid year, obviously. Yeah, I, I think he probably is the best second option in the NBA right now. Yeah. Like, I, I think he could – I would be interested to see what a Jamal Murray team looked like if he was the number one option. I would too, yeah. Uh, I don't know, like, it depends on the team construction. I don't know if that's a, I don't think that's a championship team. It's hard. It's just hard to say with, like, that – because that, que- that question is so tough because it's literally just, like – what ifs like there's no right. real right answer like there's no real there's no way to predict what it would look like yeah but well i think regardless he definitely could fill up the scoreboard um if given the the opportunity to um I, i'm actually about to make a change on the fly and i'm probably gonna get some some hate for this Mm. But I'm going to flip these two players around. So I had this person at seven, but I'm actually going to flip them back to eight. And that's where I'm going to put John Moran. Ooh. Um, oh, okay. Explain that one. And a lot, a <laughs> lot of it is just the people in front of him are either, I think, more dynamic scorers, uh, better passers, or like we're looking at like, when we get to like the elite of the elite, like offensive engines um, for their team, and so I've got I, I got Jai eight. I literally just switched him like right now. I'm typing it out on my list um, with the person in front of him. Um, and yeah, obviously, you know, like the 25 game suspension. Like I'm not even factoring any of that into it. Like he's not going to make the All Star game this year because of that. Um, all the off the court stuff aside, like is easily one of the most exciting players in the NBA. Um, obviously, last season put up twenty six a night, eight assists, um, six rebounds. Has all the highlights. Um, you know, I think the shooting has gotten better over his time. You know, in the league, 
Um, I think it's three point percentage is always fluctuated around like low 30s. I don't know if that's ever going to get too much higher. I think efficiency is a little bit like people hold too much weight to it, especially for a guy like Ja who can like drive to the rack so much. People want everybody to be 50, 40, 90, bro. I swear. Right. Like, just, people want not, everyone to not miss. Like no one, not everyone's Kevin Durant, bro. Like it's fine. Right. And he's not shooting a ton, a ton of threes. Like he's shooting like four to five threes a game he makes one to two like that's not the greatest efficiency obviously but like it's not like he's dylan brooks and shooting like eight a game and making one <laughs> mm. <laughs> um but but yeah honestly like as we go through the list i'll kind of dive into it more but all the people that are in front of him i think are more dynamic scores um better playmakers like a sizable gap in terms of playmaking and it's not to me it's obviously not just like raw assist numbers like i think there's so much more that goes into playmaking than that um and then like when we're talking we get to guys like luca and trey young it's like dudes are like full-blown engines for their offense um so it might be a little low for Ja, but uh, that's Kind of just what I'm feeling going into next year. And the people that I have in front of him, I do all think are deserving, have shown it in the past, and are going to show it again this year, um, that they are just as, if not better. Interesting. That is very, very interesting. So I I technically didn't have Ja ranked mm-hmm. because if we're looking forward, like projecting the suspension, like obviously he's not going to make any all-star game, he's not going to make any all-NBAs. But like, but I did put if I rank him on here where he would be, and I'll talk about that more when when we get to that point. But I, I definitely have him a little bit higher. So that, that's interesting. That's interesting for sure. So so he was at eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Damn, that is that is. I ain't gonna lie. That's low. That is low. Yeah, but but now nah, these other guys. Nah, these other, I see what you're saying because these other guys, like especially if we're projecting going into the next season, like these guys have cases that. Mm-hmm they can end up being better than him. So I, I'm not mad at it. But number seven for me, I have De'Aaron Fox. Okay. That's where I have number seven. And this is where we're starting to get into that number one option. I mean, obviously, there's a case between him and Sabonis, who's really the number one over there. But we've seen come playoff time. Like, right. it it was De'Aaron Fox. But um, the only thing that concerned me a little bit about De'Aaron Fox is the fact that he's going into, I believe this is year six or he's seven. He's been in the league for a while. Like, he's been in the league. I'm trying to see if I could pull it up. But he's also, I feel like he's young. He's probably, like, maybe just turned 26. Because he, he, got, he got drafted with Lonzo, didn't he? He's 25. <clears throat> He's 25. He's been the what, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is gonna be year seven. Yep. Jesus, yo, he's been in the league for a little minute. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I'm okay. So yeah, I guess he still is young. Damn, that kind of changes things. I might have to switch my list around now. <laughs> Cause like, yeah, I, I really just looked at the fact that he was going into year seven, and I'm thinking, obviously, I still, I do feel like he can still get better. I'm not saying that like he can't improve or anything. But it's like, year seven, you've been in the league for a, a minute. But the fact that he's 25, you know, I'm going to leave it at is, as is. I'm going to leave it at is. Um, I do feel like, like I said, I feel like he can get better. But I don't know. I just feel like the other guys ahead of him, like you talked about it, can literally be offensive engines for their, or they are offensive engines for their right. team. The numbers that they put up. All of these guys I have ahead of them, except for maybe one, already puts up better numbers. We've seen Fox perform in the playoffs. You know, he stepped up big. I feel like if he didn't have that thumb injury or he injured his hand or whatever happened, we could be looking at, instead of a first-round exit, they could be in the second round yep. losing to the Lakers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but still. Um, but the guy, the guy I have directly ahead of him has already had a deep playoff run. He's one of the best offensive engines in the league, so... I just feel like for me personally, seven is is perfect for where I have De'Aaron Fox. Okay, I have De'Aaron Fox at seven too. So that was who okay. I just flipped with John Morant. Okay. Um, and like looking at those two, obviously De'Aaron Fox does benefit a lot from playing with a guy that's as dynamic as Sabonis. 
Um, we saw what their two-man game was able to do in the playoffs, really all season long for the Kings, um, like their ability to play off each other, the DHO action, the screen action. Um, they're able to do a lot there in Sacramento. What impressed me the most about De'Aaron Fox this past season was he legitimately is a, like a three-level scorer and the ability to create off the dribble at the perimeter, catch and shoot from three, to take somebody off the dribble, snatch back, mid-range is good. And obviously he has the speed um, to get to the rim, crafty finishes, finishes through contact. Uh, I just think he's a more dynamic scorer than Ja, um, like at all, all three levels. Um, and I think his ability to play make still, uh, again, the two-man game with Sabonis obviously helping that out still. But, um, you know, I think he's able to get a lot of those guys in Sacramento, you know, involved. Again, we saw what he was able to do in the playoffs against the Warriors. And like you said, if that thumb injury doesn't happen, like – could be a whole different tune. Like he was, he might have been able to take out the Warriors five. And even with the thumb injury, they honestly probably still should have got it done in game six. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think coming off of that experience, coming off of being the, and they were the three seed in a very tough Western conference. Like that, I think, has gotten overlooked a little bit. Um, and a lot of that was on the back of his play. And again, he's coming off of a, um, an All NBA season, first time as an All Star, so first time All Star and first time All NBA for the first time last year. Um, Sabonis also, I think, was All Star and All NBA last year. Um, and I think this Kings team has the potential to be better from last season. Obviously, they didn't really make a ton of tra- like trades or you know free agency signings, but. When we a couple episodes ago we talked about Keegan Murray's development, um, and I think De'Aaron Fox now like has taken another leap forward, um, and so I think having another off season there with Mike Brown and I really another thing that I think is a little underrated with De'Aaron Fox, he gives effort. Like, there's a lot of times I was watching Kings games last year. Where, like I said, they weren't the best defensive team in basketball, like, by any stretch of the imagination. But there's a lot of times where he's diving for loose balls. He's poking balls free. Like, he's giving – at worst, he's giving you effort on the defensive side of the ball. And some of that can be attributed to Mike Brown. Like, he's a defensive coach. He's always going to get people rallied up on that. And just as a motivator, like, you've seen the clips of him doing the sprints in the, the Sacramento gym. Um, it's like, he's somebody that can get his guys going, but to me, why I flipped him in jaw, like I said, I think he's just, he's a more dynamic scorer. Um, and I think that will continue to grow going into next season as the talent around him, around him continues to get better and guys like Keegan Murray. Um, and you'll get another year with him and Sabonis, um, probably trying to replicate a lot of what Jamal and Jokic do. In Denver. Okay. Um, so you'd rather have Fox going into the next season than John Morant? Just like obviously susp- suspension aside and stuff. I would. I would. <clears throat> okay. I I think I'll just talk since the topic is up. I'll just talk about it now. Um, I'm a, I'm gonna defend Ja a little bit. Um, so I actually I think I'd rather have Ja going into the next season or just projecting moving forward. I think I'd rather have Ja um, moving forward. Me personally, on my list, if he was ranked. I would technically have him at five mm-hmm. if he was like ranked on my list. And I just think, I don't think you're doing this at all, but I just think people in general are forgetting how good Ja Morant was and is. And just like this suspension, a lot of the off the court stuff between that, between the injuries, between the Grizzlies, winning a lot of games without him, I will admit that. They do win a lot of games even when he's not on the court. I just think people are kind of underrating Ja a little bit. Like, I, it wasn't too long ago where people ha- were having Ja in the top 10 players in the NBA. You know what I mean? Like, he was in that conversation of one of the best players in the league, future face of the NBA. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, like, big moments, uh, me personally, I, I'm really big into playoff performances. You being, you having really big moments, you showing that the lights aren't too bright. People forget Ja Morant was 
is obviously the leader of the Grizzlies. Um, in their playoffs runs, you've seen him going at it with the Timberwolves. See how he stepped up. He had big performances when he were go when he was going at it with the Warriors. He stepped up. He had big performances. The only his only real knock on him in the playoffs is that he kept he keep getting injured. Even yeah. this class, this past postseason, he played through an injury. I believe. No, he had the wrist injury. Yeah, through the wrist. So he he played through that, and he still, I believe, the game after came out and put up what was it, like forty like forty five points. It was, it was a little bit. It was a little bit meaningless, I will say. A lot of it was a little bit late, but he, he shit, went on like a twenty-point run by himself. By himself or yeah. yeah, like like Ja is capable of those big games, those big performances in the biggest moments, and I just feel like that goes a little bit overlooked, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, it's like I I would agree. I think Fox is a little bit more dynamic as a scorer. I'll admit that, but I mean, I don't I don't think it's a big enough gap, in my opinion to where I would overlook the big games and the big performances that Ja gives you. Because, obviously, the Grizzlies win a lot of games without him, but I feel like if they don't have Ja, they're not making any real noise. Uh, yeah, I don't buy that argument. I, like, that, I think, is dumb. Because like, it was yeah. two years ago where he was out for, what, like 20 or 30 games, and they had a better win percentage when he, was off, when he wasn't playing than when he did. Yeah. Like, there are some people that try to start that narrative that, like... They're better without him. They're, I don't think like, That's stupid. crazy. Um, but this, this is what I'll say to that. A, De'Aaron Fox did just win Clutch Player of the Year. He did, hundred um, yeah, percent. I think he led the league in, in clutch points by like a wide margin. Mm -hmm. But this year was, I mean, like the first year that the Kings were a, a good enough team to make the playoffs. And like you said, he had multiple very good performances um, against that um, against the Warriors. Like, let me pull up his his playoff stats because I feel like he more than. Like, I would say watching Sabonis in that series, Sabonis kind of stunk it up a little bit. He was not times. good. He uh -huh. was not to me. He was not good in that series, like yeah. at all. It, like, De'Aaron Fox came to play in every single one of those games, even when he was injured. You could see he was, he was still getting to his spots, still getting open. Like, it just was clear that like his thumb was bothering him on the shots. But I mean, to put up twenty eight and eight and five rebounds. Um, against the defending champs and like the injury obviously hurt but can i get, let me see if i can pull up his like but, game by game stats but i will say too it's not like jot hasn't played well again i think he played well against a better warriors team the year before so it's like because I, I don't honestly i really don't think this warrior team is good not discrediting fox no they, fox yeah they they definitely but, were better the year prior. I was say, like, I don't think that it's, this Warriors team was good. Like, they just they weren't a good team to me. Um, all right, I'll ask you this question: Who do you think is closer to their ceiling right now, Fox or Morant? Mm. I, I mean, I guess probably Fox, but at the same time. How many more years are we going to get of Ja like this before, like, the bounce doesn't live forever. Mm -hmm. and, like, we've seen that throughout every single guard that plays this way. Guys like Derrick Rose, injury aside, but then even, like, John Wall, Russell Westbrook, like, hyper-athletic point guards. The game has to shift a little bit. So, like, ceiling-wise, I think Ja probably has more room there. But at a point in time, that being able to be dynamic three-level score, create for yourself, like get to those shots, like that will trend. That is already trending towards the Aaron Fox, and that's going to be where Jaws' game is going to have to go, mm -hmm. just in terms of longevity. Because you start getting into your thirty, like not like and that's not. I don't think that he's necessarily injury riddled, but like you said, he's had multiple injuries now in the playoffs. A lot of that has all been due to like even the wrist injury was like. He landed after trying to like jump over somebody on yeah. his hand. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that kind of that comes with the territory of playing like that. So, at a point in time, he's going to have to develop more of those other parts of his game. I don't think that he's necessarily a bad shooter or incapable of, you know, he's not like strictly a rim runner, mm -hmm. but that's where he, you know, makes a lot of his points. That's what makes him such an explosive player is his ability to get downhill and finish at the rim through contact. Um, but those other parts of his game are going to have to grow. 
for him to you know continue to be at this level long term. Okay, that's probably that's probably the perfect way to put it. Because yeah, I I agree with pretty much everything you said. I do feel like Fox is closer to his ceiling, and that could be the reason why I have Ja ahead of him as well. Because I don't know how much De'Aaron Fox can get, how much better De'Aaron Fox can get. And like I just said before, I feel like Ja we were we were just talking about Ja, or the the media was just talking about Ja in that like maybe one of the top ten players in the league like just a year or a couple years ago. So it's just like I just genuinely feel like obviously no, I'm not talking about you, but just in general, people as a whole are just underrating him a little bit. Yeah. Um so yeah, okay. But no, I, I agree with what you're saying. I definitely agree with you're saying. He's going to have to improve his offensive game a little bit as far as just being able to score in multiple different ways. Because, yeah, those that athletic guard, the super high-flying, crazy dunk point guards, like they just – if it's just proven that you need to be able to develop multiple ways to score and develop some sort of a jump shot so that your game can kind of, you know, transition into the later part of his career. So, mm-hmm. um, so I have Fox at seven. So that was our seven. Yep. Number six, number six, I have Trey Young. Um, another guy who I do f- feel like gets a little bit disrespected. Um, mm-hmm. Honestly, I really feel like it's becoming a meme at this point. Like, it's just a joke to hate on Trey Young. Like, it's just because I know he's had the whole villain thing. Right. You know, going into Madison Square Garden, everyone in New York hates him. But I feel like it kind of like spewed over a little bit into just regular NBA discourse. I feel like a lot of people underrate what Trey Young does. And I feel like you talk about it a lot the fact that he is one of the best offensive engines in the entire NBA. The mm-hmm. fact that he generates everything for that team. I just feel like besides DeJounte, who on that team really creates for themselves and like creates their own shot? Nobody. And, like, they all need him to set them up. Like all of them. So I just feel like that goes a little bit underrated. So the fact that he's doing all that, averaging I don't even have the stats put up. Twenty seven and ten last year and didn't make the all star game. Right, like that's crazy to me. That's crazy. He is the entire offense, and it's not, it's it's not like you can't even make the case that like all right, he's doing all that in the regular season. He's went on the Eastern Conference Finals run, even in this past postseason. You saw the game winner that he hit. That was like the cap off for like a thirty some point night. It's like right, bro. He's had the moments in the playoffs. He has the moment. He has the stats in the regular season. He runs everything for the offense. The only knock on him is that he's literally a horrible defender and that i'm not gonna argue he's a terrible defender but just offensively there's not many people in the league that can generate as much offense as well as he does i want to ask you this because i knew this was going to come up and i saw i think draymond was talking to trey young about this i don't know this is like some live show recently um and he talked about how Trey and Luca's careers are obviously always going to be linked because they got traded for one another on draft night. Mm-hmm. Why is the like the gap between Luca and Trey so wide? And I'm saying this because both of them are the like they play very old, very heliocentric style offense. Like everything goes through them. They both are offensive engines for their team. They both can give you, like, easily could average 28, 30 points a game with 10-plus assists. Easily. It could, like, sleepwalk to those stats most nights. Both of them have led their team to conference finals appearances. Neither one of them has, like, gone further than that. But when the people talk about, it, people talk about the two of them, it's like the gap is crazy. It's like Luka is all the way up here and... Trey Young can't make the All Star game of <laughs> twenty seven and ten, mm-hmm. and I like, I'm not gonna sit up here and like go as far as say I think Trey Young is better than Luca. I think Luca is better, but <clears throat> which I think is like that should be consensus. I just feel like we're reaching the point where it's getting disrespectful to Trey to act like the gap is like crazy. Like, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Right, I, like. I just think, I I think there is definitely a gap, but it's more a gap in the side of Trey Young disrespect, basically. Mm-hmm. Like I think just Trey Young should be talked about a little bit higher 
rather than like trying to bring them a little bit closer. It should just bring Trey, bring Trey Young up because I do think Luca is at like this top. Like people call him top five player in the league. There's some people who say he's a top three player in the league, and I believe it's rightfully so. I believe he is at that level, and I still feel like he has a lot of room to get better. To where, listen, Luca. With a good team around him, could get to the point where he's winning championships. You know what I mean? Like he's at that like could potentially be an all time great. And I just I don't personally I don't think Trey Young can get to that level. So I mm-hmm. do think that there's a gap. But I agree. I just feel like it's more on the side of Trey Young disrespect because you you said it like they've accomplished the same things right now. Trey Young's numbers aren't bad. Like he's twenty seven and ten is amazing. They like, are like. The only, like, what, Luca probably put up, what, 30 a night last year? 32. 32. 32 and 8 versus 27 and 10. I would say he's a, obviously, he's a better rebounder. I think Luca is a better, is a better all-around scorer. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just think, like I said, I just think it's Trey Young disrespect. I do think Luca is, I, I think there's a definite gap. Like, I think Luca is at that one of the best players in the NBA. And I don't think Trey could ever really reach that. You know what I mean? So I think that's the reason why, along with the fact that, you know, Trey Young's this villain, like he just has that, you know, you know, certain people just get that that narrative to them and it's just hard to eliminate it. I think he just has that narrative and a lot of people just don't like him for some reason. And defensively, Luca's not a good defender. Luca's actually a bad defender. So it's not like yeah. it's a, a big gap there. Right. Like, <laughs> Trey Young is like is like a terrible defense. Like Luca's bad, too. But Trey Young is terrible and like Luca's bad to the point where like he just is not trying I feel like because Luca is six 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 seven six seven right so that's like, what I'm saying he has the tools the genetic tools to be a good defender I'm not and he don't even he's... need to be good he just needs right. to be because I don't he's not athletic so you don't even need right. to be like a great defender you don't you even need to be a two-way be horrible exactly like just don't be a liability Trey Young just doesn't even have the tools to not right. be a liability so um I think all those things are a combination of the reason why people talk about them like it's just like night and day like it's like luke you're talking about the next lebron and then like a six man you know what i mean like i don't yeah. think it's people talk about it like that and it's not like that i think people just need to respect trey young a little bit more okay because that, that, i think how you put it is right like i don't think it has anything to do with people overrating luca as much as people are disrespecting trey young because mm-hmm. like i said i think there's a gap there i think luca is a better scorer I think Luca, in terms of like raw passing ability, is like top two, three in the NBA. Like, mm-hmm. I agree. I will forever like the pass last year against Indiana, where he was like triple teamed on the baseline and threw like a curveball that like went out yeah. of bounds and spun back to the other corner is like crazy. That just takes wild ability, and then like his court vision at the same time is like. It's different from like so many of Trey Young's assists come from lobs, like mm-hmm. his ability to like work the pick and roll and like hit those quick hitting lobs to Clint. I think Clint and Onyeka both were top two in the league in alley oop dunks last year. <laughs> like, how do you Makes have sense. two like two people and they're both top two? Like, you're throwing an insane amount of lobs. Luca has like that otherworldly court vision that's like bro you like it's like you're I'm, looking at the like you're playing basketball in real life but like you're looking at it like you're on 2k like you can see the whole court at all I'm finding times. people in the corner i'm finding people on the roll right. i'm finding people in the block like, i'm yeah. going up for a layup i'm looking at the rim and i threw the ball behind my head and somebody just is yeah. right there is like that is where the gap is i just like you said i feel like people will be acting like trey young is like this bum in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, bro, you can't be a bum putting up those stats. Like, you can give me the defensive argument like that's fair. Like, he is a very bad defender. <laughs> and again, like, I don't think he'll ever be a decent defender. And that just is what it is. Bro is 6'1", 160. Like, he just doesn't have the tools for it. All right, it's going to be tough. That's part of why I think the DeJounte fit makes sense right like you bring in a guard who can try to help patch up the defense that trey young can't provide Mm -hmm. um and somebody who hopefully like they can learn to play a little bit more off ball the both of them like that is something that i think could what would be the next step in trey young's game 
especially if DeJounte is going to stay there long term, is if he can learn to be more effective off ball, because there's been times in the past where it's like, bro, if Trey Young does not have the ball in his hands, he's just standing there. Mm -hmm. There's no motion. There's no involvement in the offense. Like, he just is there. If he can learn to be more of a threat off ball, if he can, you know, some of this is going to come down to coaching too, like get him in, you know, off ball actions, you know, screens, coming off of pin downs, whatever it is. Because bro is one of the better shooters in the league. Efficiency has been kind of up and down the last couple seasons. Um, but if he gets it going, can shoot from deep, can shoot from super deep, like with the best of them. Um, and again, 27 and 10. Like, yeah, it's just those are ridiculous stats. Um, and he has the playoff performances too. So I have Trey Young higher on my list than you. Um, you know what it is too, though, um, that I just thought about? I think another thing is the fact that Trey Young has had bad moments. And, like, you can't really think of any bad moment that Luca's had. Like, Trey Young, like that Miami series. I mean, he, they, was getting he did just boxed. miss the playing tournament. He did. <laughs> that is true. Um, but again, I I feel like Luca is okay. So some of it you could say Luca is kind of in that. Certain people kind of get babied a little bit. I feel like, you know what I mean? Because if like if Trey Young was the 11 seed and like missed the playoffs, he'd be traded. <laughs> like they'd like he'd he be was out of there. He was in Trey Talks this year going – he made the playoffs. And before that game, there are rumors that he, like, he's on the table to, like, get right. traded. Yeah. Luka so. literally, like, they didn't even make the play-in tournament. And it's yeah. like, we have to put a better roster around him. What, <laughs> what can we do to make him happy or else he's going to ask out? Like, <laughs> he does get babied a little bit. But, again, I just think that it's because of the, the ceiling difference. It's like Luka – at his best, there's no one on the planet that can stop him. There's no team on the bro. What he does to the Clippers it feels like annually now. Like <laughs> he, whether he loses the series or not, he destroys them. Like Paul George and Kawhi probably has nightmares about Luca because it's like you gonna uh, guard him. The three on the Black Lives Matter logo is one of the craziest. Was things. crazy. It was wild, bro. But it's like. <laughs> All right, you can try. You can take your turn guarding him. My six eight elite defender Kawhi, you're, you're food. All right, Paul George, my other six eight wing defender, you're food. Marcus Morris, put a smaller guy on him. Like he, it does not matter. There's no team. There's no. There's no system. There's no scheme that's gonna stop him. Trey Young, we've seen like you kind. You get taller, lengthy defenders on him, he, and you can make him struggle a little bit. Yeah. I will say on the side of Trey Young though. That could be attributed to the roster construction. How we talked about, he's the only guy that creates for anyone on that right. team. So it's like, if I'm that's have why the... he got boxed against the Heat two years ago. It's like, yeah, literally, it's like if we just don't let Trey Young get it going. Like, what can this Atlanta Hawks team do? Nothing yeah. at all. <laughs> exactly. So I do feel like that's a little bit a part of it. But I mean, I don't know. I guess I, those Dallas team, not a lot of people was creating either. But I mean, it, like again, that goes into the fact that Luca is six and seven. It's hard. It's gonna be harder to disrupt disrupt him, anyways. And Trey Young right. is like six one, so those those bad moments could be another reason why I feel like he gets disrespected, and they make make it seem like that gap is like completely, you know, what I'm saying completely wide. But uh, I don't know. I, I I agree. I think Luca. I think Luca gets babied a little bit. I will say that. Like Luca has a little bit of that. Who else? Like Steph. I feel like Steph gets babied a little bit. Um. I mean, if we're talking about cross sports, I feel like a guy like Justin Herbert, like Pat Mahomes gets baby a little bit, even though he gets a little bit of slack. But the Pat Mahomes get a little get baby a little bit. I, there's certain people in sports that like, yeah, to an extent they can do no wrong. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. I, I, look, I, I think it's fair. I just I, when I was listening to him talk to Draymond about it, and Draymond is sitting here walking through, and he was like, like I said, like y'all have really a, accomplished. The same, like, it's not like one of y'all's won a championship or something. The other one hasn't made it out of the first round. Mm. Y'all both have brought your team to the conference finals. Both of those were, like, unexpected for y'all to get that far. And to get there, y'all had to have very, very good performances. Y'all both can super engine offense. Um, it's like, why do you feel like the gap is so big? And Trey Young, like, was open and honest about it. He brought up the villain thing, too, about, like, 
you know, he kind of get he's he he has that like narrative about him, and that's probably never going to change. Um, he was like every arena that he goes to now, like, he doesn't even interact with the fans. Like the fans randomly just be chanting like "F Trey Young," like. I should look. He be a plus on him too, though, because it's like, bro, if he's going through all that, if he literally has like F Trey Young chance, like he's getting, he got spat on before, like. <laughs> And he comes out there and drops 30 and 10? Like, that should low-key be a plus on him. The fact that he goes out there, goes into Madison Square Garden, hears those chants, brings on the chants, and then eliminates y'all. Bro hit the dagger in downtown New York City, walked onto the Knicks logo, and then bowed to the crowd. That's hard, bro. That's so that's hard. disrespectful, bro. <laughs> that is one of the, like, bro, that is one of the most iconic playoff performances in recent history just like not even like from what's going on but just like the outside off the court kind of drama and how he reacted to it like he really played up to it like like the wwe or something like, yeah, 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 bro, he, like that was hard bro that, um, that was hard yeah we just spent man i don't know what number that was your number six right <laughs> yeah, <I'll see>. yeah. <laughs> um at six i have shay um oh yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, you gotta explain that one. <laughs> okay, look, it's gonna be the same reasons where like we're reaching the point where it's like the people in front of him are offensive engines or better scorers. Like soup like I'm we're talking like best scorers in the league level. Which is like Shea is right there. Mm-hmm. Um so that's why I have the it's less about him. And more about just the people I have in front of him, liking what they bring to the table as a whole better. But mm-hmm. um, I think, like again, look, this is still like this is what year f- going to year five, Shay, year six, yeah, year six, six Shay. Mm-hmm. He's only twenty. He just turned twenty five like two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is like his first like. Full, full breakout season, obviously, being All-NBA, All-Star. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I could see, and like, as I'm looking at it on my list, like, he could easily be five, four on this list. I really want to see him and Chet together, um, and I want to see how that impacts his game. But in terms of, I think he is the best uh paint scoring guard in the league and it's like it's really like him little drop jaw and then like i feel like a pretty decent gap um between anybody else i, I think i just seen a stat that said he, le- he led the league in drives per game the past two seasons or something yeah like that. i think it's like i just saw that too it was like 13 or 14 a night um his craftiness his ability to score um like his ability to, to get to the paint, to score in the paint, to score through contact, to drive, and then that little, like, 10 to 12, 15-foot range that he works out into. Automatic. Um, right. Fadeaways, step backs, low jumpers, floaters, whatever. Like, he is one of the best scoring guards. And, is again, like, the, the rare combination of, like, length and ability to – get to those spots in the paint um is why i have him over the guys that i do like over guys like you know De'Aaron, dg whatever um and i think i really am interested to see him and chet play together this year um but yeah like i said the only pe- the people that i have in front of him are people that have already been offensive engines or or I think I are on the path to being one. Um, and that's just not Shay's game. So, like, that, it kind of comes down to personal preference a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. do you I, – I take somebody that could give me, like, when you put up 31 and a half points and five assists or somebody that could give me, like, 26 and 12 assists and, like, really, like, be pushing all – like, carrying the whole offensive load for this team, both from a scoring perspective and a playmaking perspective. So, it's a little bit of personal preference. I would not fault anybody for having Shea up to, like, four. 
I don't know if there's any case for him to really be higher than that, just because then you kind of no. reach that that top tier. But like, I have no issues with anybody putting Shay that high. It just was personal prep. And like, realistically, this stretch from like six to four. I mean, like, we're I'm splitting hairs trying to rank these three. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, in any order of, that you have them in, I'm cool with it. I definitely think it's a matter of personal preference. That makes them that because it's like spoiler alert. I have shaved pretty high. <laughs> like I have shaved, and I think that's very, fair, very bro. Literally, <clears throat> I mean, th- bro, thirty-two almost points a night in the NBA is very hard to do. Very on any team. I don't care if you're on the best team in basketball or the worst team in basketball. Like mm. that's hard to do and the way that he's doing it is so impressive like, i would say he's not hitting a lot it's like he's hitting a lot of threes either he doesn't like, he's, shoot a lot period he, do, he doesn't <laughs> like he gets to the line he gets to the basket he gets to the line he gets to the mid-range he gets to his spots and he bro he's a bucket like shay is a bucket he shoots 18 two-point attempts a night that's in crazy. the year 2023 right that's yeah bar. that's crazy but i just think um all right, so I'll, I'll just say number five for me is Tyrese Halliburton. Okay. Um, and the reason I say I'd have Shea ahead of him, I guess, yeah, when you really think about it, it really just is personal preference because I think I'm on the same train with you as far as thinking that Tyrese Halliburton is going to take that leap and really mm-hmm. become that, you know, elite offensive engine type of player to where he's putting up 20, like you said, tw- I think it's 25 and 12. Like, he, he could, I think he could reach that for sure this next upcoming season. But the fact that... Listen, Shea, 32 points a game is a lot. He's only 25. He made first team All-NBA this past yeah. year. And it's like, we talked about it. You don't hit your prime, your real prime to what, 27? 27. <laughs> so it's like. <laughs> two years to go still. If I have a guy who's quote-unquote two years away from his peak of his powers, and he just made first team All-NBA and averaged 30 points a game and won more games than the 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 win totals and whoever was predict predicting records before the season for the OKC Thunder won way more games than projected. They weren't supposed to win as many games as they did. They weren't supposed to be fighting for a play-in spot. Definitely not at, without Chet. It's exactly, especially after losing Chet. So it's like you get Chet back, you get all these young players to develop a little bit more. You're coming off a of first team all NBA and 30 point per game season and it's like like, I, I just, bro, I think OKC as a whole is going to be better. And I just think, bro, Shea still has so much room to grow. And the fact that Tyrese technically hasn't made the breakout yet, even though I believe the breakout is coming, the fact that he hasn't made it yet, and I think Shea still has more room to grow, that's the reason why I have I have him ahead of Tyrese. But um, I guess I kind of just lumped my four, my five and four together because yeah. – I think I think we have the same three. I think everyone in the world has the same top three. <laughs> yeah. So, so I just I guess I'll just say my five and my four is Tyrese Halliburton is my five. Shea is my four. Um, mm. Yeah. I just think that's the only reason why I have Shea ahead. I guess it is personal preference because man, thirty two points a game. You know my favorite player of all time is Kobe. We don't need to pass. Well, I don't want you to pass. What I need you to pass for, bro. I'd rather you go up on four people, bro. Go shoot it. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I, I think Tyrese Halliburton. He will take that leap this year as far as being one of those like top of the league offensive engines, running everything for that team. The assist numbers with Obi Toppin over there now, Bruce Brown, all them shooters around him. The assist numbers are gonna be crazy. Um he's already super efficient. We talked about it in our breakout players um uh, last episode, but yeah, Tyrese, I I could see why someone would have him ahead of Shea. Just again, I think it's just personal preference for me. Mm-hmm. So my five and four at five i have tyrese and then at four i have trey young mm-hmm. um and like you said same like I, we all had talked about tyrese on the the breakout candidate episode i think that he's going like like i said he can put himself right on the cusp of that tier which is steph luca dane and so that's where i have him ranked going into you know what i'm projecting out of him next year um For the same reasons, really, like, I have Trey Young at that four spot. Like, putting up 21 and 10, um, you know, in a year where he had, like, dealt with the the elbow injuries, um, 
and the Pacers kind of, you know, fell out of playoff contention. So it, it kind of went a little bit downhill for them at the end. But obviously bringing in Obi and Bruce Brown, like, I think this year for Tyrese Halliburton is going to be the year that – or he's well, I guess he made the All-Star game last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he has the potential to be an you know, all-NBA player. I think he has the potential to move and become, like, a legitimate, like, solidify himself as, like, a top five for PG in the league. Um and so I'm not going to harp on it too much because if you want more breakdown, go watch that episode because we, we spent a lot of time on it. Uh, but, yeah, for the same reasons, like, that I have Trey Young there, like, like I said, it's personal preference a little bit. Like, Shea, I think, is a better scorer right now than both of them, definitely in terms of getting to the basket. Um, but just as a whole, like, just the raw stats too. Like, bro, 32 points a game is 32 points a game. It doesn't matter how you slice it. Mm-hmm. Um but the Tyrese to me, the like I said, Trey Young getting so many of assists off of pick and roll, off of lobs, and like driving their offense that way. Tyrese to me is cut from a similar cloth of court vision as Luca. Like when I watch him play, he has that. How did you see that type of like a lot of those passes night in night out, and then like the pass difficulty that he makes. Um, He's got the flair. He's got the flash to it as well. Um, and then you're, you're bringing in a guy like Obi Toppin to be a lob threat for them as well. So, like, that will also get added because they didn't really have somebody like that, um, you know, with, with Miles Turner, who plays significantly more at the, the perimeter um, as, a, as a big man. So I think that the spacing for the Pacers going into next season um, – is going to lend itself really nicely for Tyrese to like just get up and down the court with a lot of athletic guys to be able to push the pace. He can create for himself. He can shoot very well. I think I say he's going to probably going to be a 50, 40, 90 guy a couple of times in his career. Um, And I really think he can, he bumps his points per game up a little bit. Like I think he could vary. He could average like bro 11 or 12 assists in an NBA, which is very hard to do. Um, and so that's why I have him at five. And then we already spent a lot of time at, on Trey Young. So I have Trey Young at four. But like I said, this four through six, Trey, Tyree, Shea, any order that you put these guys, like I think this is the the, the next tier of point guards um, to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so then one through three, uh, probably all have the same three, probably in the same order. Same order, yeah. Yeah. So you want to just list them all out? Yeah. All right. My three is Damian Lillard. My two is Luca. My one is Steph. Yeah. That's I. I don't really think there's a way you can put those in a different order. Like that's hard to put Unless, name over Luca or Luca actually, over nah. Steph. I was about to say I was trying to. I'm trying to just think of some. I just it's no way because even if Luca takes that step and like wins a championship, it's like. Steph, Steph Curry, Steph, Steph. <laughs> yeah. Steph Curry. Yeah. like you can't. Yeah. It's, it's, who, it's, who is coming off of arguably his like. There's an argument to be made that this is his one of, if not his best season ever. I easily think that this is the best version of Steph Curry ever. Right. Because of all the reasons that we talked about before, the fact that like he's put a little bit of muscle on his frame. He's obviously still shoots the ball as the best player in the as the best shooter like in history of the NBA. But still, the fact he's able to get to the basket so effortlessly, and I feel like he's he's able to carry a little bit more than in in previous years. You know what I mean? So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this, I think this is the best version of Steph right now. Uh, I was listening to Through the Wire yesterday, and they did like I think a, they did a draft on um, like yeah, all, seen that. yeah, MB, all the, MVP. the MVPs. That was a really good episode, bro. <laughs> they were talking about that. Was it the, the 2015 2016 season where he won MVP? Mm-hmm. Bro, his numbers really do not make sense. Like looking back on that year. Like, I'm not looking up. he put up 37 and two steals with with five and a half rebounds on 48% from the field. He shot 40. Oh, no, wait, wait. This is the wrong way. Oh, he shot Damn. 45% yeah. from three. <laughs> On a l- shooting 11 threes a game, bro is not. <coughs> oh my god, <laughs> well, yo, bro, 
Uh, shooting 11 threes a game and making 45% of them is otherworldly, like, impressive. Jesus That's, Christ. Bro, that is insane. Bro, this guy's worst shooting, three-point shooting percentage season is, like, some people's best. <laughs> best right. <laughs> in 2021, he really shot 38%. That's a, that's a down year. <laughs> like, that's a bad year for him. Yo, this guy is... Oh my God, bro! Yeah. Is there is there more of like a like in any sort of like all right? What is the how can I how can I even word this question? All right, you know how like Steph is like the greatest shooter of all time. And there's no debate. Like no one can argue. Is there any category or like stat that is so clear cut for anyone else in any sport? Like just any sport, oh, anything. That's um, like this guy is the best. And as of now, because like, right, if you even say like Tom Brady being the goal, hot take or not, I think Patrick Mahomes is gonna be the goal. That's what I feel like. I, like I think it's it should be clear that like if we're just looking off a of talent, Pat Mahomes is the greatest quarterback we've ever seen. That's what I'm saying. And like you can't, there's no one in the league right now or coming to league that I'm like, yeah, he could possibly be a better shooter than Steph. No. But- I was watching, so I watched the the Steph Curry documentary that just came out, and then like it starts right when he basically broke the three point records, where like they started all the film out, and it's like, bro, the record was at two thousand nine hundred and seventy four. So it's like he he clipped. No one had ever eclipsed three thousand. He is doing that at age. What is he? Thirty five. Mm-hmm. Bro, probably got what minimum like four or five more years like bro is going to he's gonna hit like four racks yeah who's he get who's gonna pass that no that's what i'm saying like i don't think there's a more of a clear cut like person in any category that like that like i can't i can't think of anything like Steph Curry is easily the greatest shooter ever and there's like there's not even someone you could be like, oh, maybe him. Like, no, there's no debate. Like, if you debate anyone else, you're just a hater. That, that's just it. You're just trying. Like, you're trying too hard to be different. <laughs> right. Because right. there's, there, yeah, like you said, it's no. These are not human numbers, bro. These are not human numbers, bro. Yeah, it does not make sense. And even his free throw percentages are like, bro. He has a season where he. He shot ninety, almost ninety four percent from the free throw line, over seventy four games. Ninety, bro. You give an NBA player an empty gym, he's not putting up ninety four percent from the free throw line. That's that's unreal. He's doing that in clutch situations, in games, in opposing arenas. Te- yep, like fans are yelling at the top of their lungs trying to get this man to miss. And he's making like ninety two out of hundred. The fact that this dude, the fact that they really lost that that sixteen season, man, that's so crazy. Because bro, this could be the greatest season ever, like season as a whole. Yep. They, like nine, and could have had a ring. Honestly, if they win the championship in sixteen, I don't think there's a debate for what's the best individual season ever. How is there? Mm-mm, you've seen the stats not. of you just seen all the stats, and then the unanimous MVP, and then he wins the finals. Come on, bro. There's no. I'm sorry. There's no better singular season than that. If he was to win a championship, but every knock that like Steph has ever had in his career, I think he's addressed. Whether yeah. that's like mm-hmm. on court stuff, like he can't play. It's too small to play defense. Whatever. I just, I just told you in the MVP season, he gave you two steals a game. Like I said, I think he's he at least gives the effort. I don't think he's he's never going to be a phenomenal defender. But he's not a like a negative defender. He gives the effort. He gives the energy. I think he's good at at least like harassing, um, you know, ball handlers. And just like I said, effort is like 75% of the battle to just not being a horrible defender. So you're at least going to get that out of him. Um People talked about he made too small to be able to finish. Bro is one of the most underrated finishers in the league. He put on mm-hmm. the muscle. Like, you can't really stop him from getting to his spots. He had the ankle injuries. He wears the double ankle braces now. He worked with Under Armour to get the high top curries. 
hasn't had ankle issues in years. They didn't know if he would be able to shoot like this at the next level, if it was going to, you know, if it was going to translate how he was able to do it. And at Davidson, obviously it did. Like, and then the next bis- biggest one was like, he doesn't have the finals MVP. He has some, you know, no shows in the playoffs. And then he goes on the run after KD wins the finals MVP. It's on his back because the next best player was Wiggins. Like, he's addressed every question mark that I think people have tried to throw at his career to try to undercut him. And it's like done it in stride. And is still, like you said, I think this last year's version of Steph, maybe I shouldn't say the best, but I think it's he continues to get more and more complete as an offensive player. Like mm-hmm. I think his finishing is really like better now than it was during his MVP seasons. And I, a lot of that, again, still has to do, like, bro is getting more and more muscular each season. Like, he's bigger. He's harder. Everyone say he's in the weight room every day, even after games. He's always in the weight room. Right. He's. It's literally just harder to just, like, oh, if Steph just drives, we're just going to, you know, you know, put some physicality on him. He's not going to be able to finish. Like, bro, he's, he gets a lot of and ones. Like, he, mm-hmm. I think, is getting more complete. I think it's probably the, the better term I should use for, you know, where he is as a player right now. So, yeah, to, like I said it many times. I really think he is the best person that played point guard. It doesn't mean he's the best playmaker or facilitator, but, like, of all the people that have come through the National Basketball Association and played point guard, the best one ever is Stephen Curry. It's, yeah, it's just – it's so tough for me, hard for me to rank Steph Curry, bro, because it's like if I have a him ahead of Magic, that means, like, in an all-time list, I would have to have Curry, like, up there like ah it, and it's so I hard think, for me to I rank think curry he is like you think, do you think all right do you think he's like, like what you what you just said about like bro is there any other not even just basketball is there any other sport where we've seen somebody come in and dominate one facet to the point where it's like it's consensus there's not even a debate you can make about somebody being a better shooter ever and there's no one you could bring up to be like well at least you know like you know, Reggie Miller, you know, was this, or Ray Allen was this. Like, he's better at catch and shoot than all of them. He's better off the dribble than all of them. He's, he's better, better at everything. Than, <laughs> he's better in every single area of doing that thing by a wide margin than any of them. Like, anybody yeah. else that has ever done it prior or anybody else that's doing it right now. It is crazy. <laughs> Bro, I was trying to, I, I, like, when I was watching the, the documentary, my girl walked in and I was, like, so, something happened on the screen. I paused it and I was like, do you understand how crazy this is, like, what he's doing? And I was like, I thought about it. And I was like, D- there was a point in time, like, right around this MVP season, right? This is like 2K, 15, 16, same game cycle. Mm-hmm. The real life version of Steph Curry was more broken than the 2K version of Steph Facts. Curry. Because there was Facts. no limitless range badge. Facts. This dude was shooting from like 38, 40 feet regularly, night in, night out. And it's like, you couldn't do that in 2K because it was like, bro, that's a bad shot. Why would you, sh- you shoot it from the logo? Like, why would you shoot from the logo? Only person ever in NBA history to be better than their 2K player. Right. He, he created a badge. Like, he made, <laughs> they had to put in a badge for him because the real life Steph was better than the 2K Steph. And as bad as that game is, like, that's really telling. <laughs> that's, yo. That's crazy, man. <laughs> yeah, I can't, like, because assists is always, there's debates for everyone. Or passing, I should say, there's debates for everyone. Right. Scoring, obviously, there's debates for everyone. Rebounding, defense. Right, there's blocks. Update. You can get real specific blocks, steals. Like, <clears throat> every single aspect of the game, there's conversations and debates to be had. Even in, across sports. Like, think about, like, right. football. There, everything can be debated. Who's the everything best? Everything but like the best winner ever. Yeah, I, I think positions. There's like I think Dion's the best corner ever. Like there's it, it, right. like positions that are locked, but like parts of the game, like passer, I don't know, hand catching, route running, like all that. Like there's debates for plenty of people. Like Steph might be the only person to where like, bro, they, there's no debate. Like we it's would have to get into like zero questions. They will, we will have to get into, like, sports that I don't even know about, like, golf or, like, right. tennis or something. But, like, as far as the sports that I know of, there's there's no debate, bro. There's, there's no one 
ever better at one part of the game. Right. Yeah. So I, I've never, I don't like you said, I'm not super big on ranking players, especially all times. I think it gets way too nitpicky, but he's in the conversation to really be very high. I'm talking like top 15 all time. Oh no, he's top ten for me for sure. I think right. I, like he's he's a lock top ten. Don't that's the only reason why I had a problem, not problem, but like it's tough for me to to compare him and Magic because like I think I'm have Magic like four or five something like mm-hmm. that. So if I have Curry being better than Magic, that means I would have to put Curry like you know what I'm saying like I would have to put Curry up there, which is like, damn, that come bro, that conversation is tough. Wait, I need to we need to get hard. some. Some people that like were watching, that's what I want to do one day. I want to get somebody on the podcast who was like watching basketball, like grew up watching basketball, in, like OG. The 70s and eighties. Right? We need to get like OG, OG, up here. OG um, bro. Because I really want to get somebody's perspective who's like was locked into basketball then and is still locked into basketball now. Because like I will never ever. I'm not gonna sit up here and like get because I see people do it all the time, like get into arguments with OG and it's like. Bro, you're like 24, and you're trying to like debate with him over like Magic and Bird. It's like you've never watched Magic and Bird play. You watched right. highlight, <laughs> like all of us did. You might have watched old games like we did. It's like we were not there at the time to like see what the media was saying, to like really understand the storylines as much. Like you're, you can, it's only so much you can get from historical context, you know. So it's like, I would really want to have those conversations. I feel like that's a great question to ask him, somebody that really watched Magic's whole career and watched Steph's whole career and be like, bro, what? how do those two really stack up to each other? Because, mm. again, like in our eyes, just based on what, at least for me, and it sounds like for you as well, what I have seen of Magic, what I know of Magic, I said I think Steph is the best point guard ever, strictly looking at just the position. I think Magic is a better defender and a better passer like from just looking at totality of people that played point guard how can it not be Steph yeah (laughs) it's hard it's hard to argue bro it's hard to argue man I really wish I can go back and watch like like it's tough bro I wish I could live through certain eras bro like honestly Mm -hmm. like I would have loved to watch like for me, Jordan's Bulls, I would have loved to actually watch that so I can really know, like, all right, who's better, even though I know LeBron's better. But <laughs> that's besides the point. I would love to have watched that. Obviously, the Laker family, I would love to have watched, like, the early 2000s Shaq and Kobe. Like, wasn't old enough to comprehend what was going on, but I would love to actually, like, look at it from, like, me now at 24, if I could actually watch that. Oh, my God, that would have been amazing. But, like, yeah, I-, I wish you can go back and watch certain errors, bro. That'd be so I need to invent a time machine or something, bro. Yeah, I think um, this is the same uh, through the wire episode where they were going through um, all the MVPs and like they were talking about uh, Jordan's '88 MVP season. Then they were like, "Listen off the stats," and I was I was literally driving and I was like, "What? Like <laughs> that does not sound like a real stat line." It was like, "Bro, average." 35 points, five rebounds, six assists, 3.2 steals, and 1.6 blocks a game. That's crazy. <laughs> that, like, that's ridiculous, bro. As a guard, he almost put up two blocks a game. And, bro, 3.2 steals. What? His 88 season was ridiculous. Like, this, the numbers... Jesus Christ! He was he was yeah, he was scoring champ all star. I think he was all star game MVP. Played eighty all eighty two games, MVP, right? And defensive player of the year. Man, Dude, that's what I mean. Like, bro, like imagine being able to watch that live, bro. And that was his fourth season in the league. That's like, <laughs> who's that? That's like Shea doing that last year or something. Literally, like, like Shay Shay just came out of nowhere and was like, "Yeah, I'm about to put up like 36 a night." That's like that's like Anthony Edwards doing that this upcoming season. That's basically what it is. It's like him coming out and really is like, "I'm the best player in the world." Like, and I'm just gonna go out there and prove it. That is nuts. And it's bro. I'm looking at the season before that he put up 37 a night, and he played 82 games. <laughs> Yo, 
That's crazy. Like, bro, I'm not gonna lie to you, bro. I, I like this is why I don't ever get mad at people when they have Jordan or LeBron. Cause like I know me, especially if I'm like a Bulls fan, there is a zero percent chance if I'm a Bulls fan that Mike that LeBron could ever do anything to pass Jordan. I'm like I'm sorry, especially if I was like older and watched it. Yeah, no. I can I'm see why a lot of them stuck in their ways cuz there's there's no chance I could watch this guy just do that stat line that you just said and win six championships and be 6 and 0. Oh. There's no, no who's right. how? How's he better? How's he better? Right. I don't care, bro. I'm sorry. I'd be the biggest yeah. like Michael Jordan stan ever, bro. So I get it. It, it definitely makes sense. Like, yeah. bro, I'm just looking at these his year over year averages. Like these are dumb. All of these are stupid like <clears throat> 32, 8, and 8, 33, 7, and 7, 2.8 steals a game. Bro, his average, like, his steals per game over year, 2.4, 2.1, 2.9, 3.2, 3, 2.8, 2.7. Bro! You know what's funny, too? <laughs> like, when I watched the podcast, bro definitely did pick the worst Jordan season. <laughs> the worst <He> MVP season. <laughs> <He did. laughs> like, bro, there was so many better ones you could have picked. He picked the absolute worst one. d <laughs> Mills is funny, bro. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's crazy. We just got way off topic. Oh, D. The podcast be flowing like that, though. Yeah. That's how it be. It just be flowing. Uh, let's wrap the top 10 up. Like you said, we got Luca at two. We already spent mad time on Luca. I think he... Scoring is stupid. Like, he had way too many games last year, I think, that showcased that. The 60-20-10 and 10 game was... Crazy mm-hmm. is like all the shots that he's able to make. He make any shot on the court, post up, mid range, normal three pointer, deep three pointer, off the dribble three pointer, any six seven and bulky. So you can't really stop him from getting to the rim. He finishes through contact. Can do all of that while also being has an argument to be the best passer in basketball at the same time. Um, so. He has all of the skills to go down as one of the greatest players ever. Like, obviously, we're projecting a lot. But, again, like we said, just off the eye test and the skill set and the fact that he's still, what, 26? Um, he can actually be younger than that. He's 24. Oh, my gosh. He's 24? <laughs> yeah. He's like young, 24, 24 and 148 days. Luca just needs to come into the end, to this season and be in shape. Bro. That's all I need from you, bro. You just be in shape to the point where you're not a liability and not a terrible defender and transition defender, and that's it. And, like, you could win MVP easily and go out there and lead the Mavs on a deep playoff run. Like, bro, he really has, like, the capabilities to be an all-time great. You know, I would love to see one day, and I, I don't I don't know that it would ever happen, but a Luka and Mavericks finals against Trey Young in Atlanta. Like, I want them both on those teams. <laughs> like, the storylines right. would be crazy. Facts. Um, I, I need them both hooping, too. I need them both putting up, like, I need Luka having 40-point games. I need Trey's 40 and 10 games of game right. winners. Like, I need to see all of it. And it got to go seven games. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's why Luca's two, and then Dame Lillard obviously just being three, still is one of the best scorers in the NBA. Clearly, put up seventy one points last season, <laughs> um, and I think that ranking stays the same for him whether he stays in Portland or if he gets traded in Miami. Yeah, or is traded yeah. anywhere. Like, yeah, there's very few teams in the league that he would go to and not be the number one option on. Mm-hmm. So he's that good of a scorer. Um, last season put up 32 and seven. Um, like it's, it's not much that needs to, I feel like be said on Damian Lillard. He's another person that I sit back and I think about it. And it's like, if Steph was not in the league, he has a legitimate case to be the best shooter in the NBA. Um, and I think is one of the greatest shooters of all time. He just so happened to be playing at the same time as Steph and clay. He he literally Um, said it himself. He was like, bro, what is there? What's the argument against me being the second greatest shooter of all time? And he was just just as far as like the degree of difficulty that the shots that he takes and 
he still shoots the same. He's obviously not as good as Steph. Shoots the same. Yeah. Deep three, same Deep catch and shoot off the dribble. Like, yeah. I mean, honestly, he probably shoots more difficult shots than Steph because Steph doesn't have a, as many people creating for him. Like, Steph doesn't. Steph shoots. No. I mean, most uh, of Dame's threes are off his own self creation. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 like Steph can have like come off a screen, have Draymond set you up and like get you a, a open look. But you know, Dame, Dame has a case. Like I'm not gonna go too deep into the numbers and whatever, whatever. Right. He has a case to be the second greatest shooter I'm, ever. Bro, I'm talking straight off eye test. Like you want to have that. Even like let's even we're just talking like in the basketball right now. <clears throat> um, like you want to have that Dame versus Clay argument. Like I'm open to hearing it. Yeah, uh, like I think Clay is the better. Clay might be the best solely catch and shoot guy that's ever played. But like, we're looking at everything like shooting as a whole, right? Yeah. I'm I'm open to hearing that argument. But like you said, Dame shoots all the same level of difficulty shots that Steph does, um, and most of them are off of his own self creation. Yeah. And he has multiple series ending three pointers. <laughs> It's a dumb um, one against Paul George. That was hilarious. I bro. still to this day will never forget where I was at when I saw that happen live. We, I, we were in college, in the dorm room, turned that game on like in the fourth quarter because we saw it was close. We're watching it. I come out of the timeout. Here goes Damian Lillard. He's dribbling. We're all sitting on this little futon. We're like, bro, like the clock is running. Like, are they just ever going to get into their set? Like, he's just dribbling. And dribbling and dribbling. And it got like to what, like six, five seconds. I'm like, is he about to shoot this? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and bro just pulled it from 40 feet with Paul George in his face and cashed it. I, bro, we are running up and down the hallways in the dorm, about to get a noise complaint. But it's like, bro, that is one of the craziest shots I've ever seen. But I feel like I was had the same experience. I was literally in. I wasn't even in my room because my room, my TV wasn't working. I was literally in like you know how like dorms have like the that lounge area that yeah. you can be in. I was in there with my with my computer doing homework. My girl right next to me, and I'm just watching the TV. Same thing. I'm like, bro. I'm like, go, <laughs> go. I'm like, go. Rocking, sizing them up. Back literally. Back. I'm, I'm like, like, bro. I'm like, go. Nah, and mind you, I was rooting for him. <laughs> I was rooting for him because Russ was talking crazy. Like, I was like, and, you know, I'm a big Dame fan. I was like, bro, if they end this game, oh, my God, this would be amazing. And he, he pulled that. I was I jumped up on my seat as soon as he pulled it. Bro, that shot, insane. And then to wave him off, iconic, bro. Oh, that was, man, that's crazy, bro. So, yeah, I, I, I lean him second greatest shooter ever. I, I, yeah. I definitely listen to it. Um, So... And this is really for the shorts. Um, So what was your, let's do like your 10 to 6 best point guards in the league going into next season. 10 to 6. 10, I have Jalen Brunson. 9, I have Darius Garland. 8, I have Jamal Murray. 7, I have De'Aaron Fox. 6, I have Trey Young. Okay. At 10, I have Jamal Murray. 9, I have Darius Garland. 8, I have John Morant. 7, I have De'Aaron Fox. And then 6, I have SGA. And then okay. your top five point guards going into next season, um, projecting for next season. Five, I have Tyrese Halliburton. Four, I have Shea Gilders Alexander. Three, I have Dane. Two, I have Luca. One, I have Steph. Okay, and at five, I have Tyrese Halliburton. Four, I have Trey Young. Three, I have Damian Lillard. Two, I have Luca. And one, I have Stephen Curry. Yeah, that's the top 10 point guards, man. I'm, very, I'm interested to see how. Uh, how we gonna look back on these lists and how it's gonna play out? You know what I mean? Yeah, I want to revisit this like trade deadline next year. I honestly like, yeah, around like the All Star break. Um, I really just want to know if Tyrese is gonna make that jump because I, <laughs> I, if I could, was it Mojo like with the pick aside Mo- movie? Yes, bro. I'd have put so much bread in the Tyrese Halliburton. Bro. Thanks. I am all in on on Pacers stock and Tyrese Halliburton stock. They need to listen, Mojo. Come, come to, come to CT, bro. You come over here, or go to Texas for Billy. You know what I'm saying? We, we'll, we'll make some bread, bro. We will right. make some bread. Hundred <clears throat> percent. Um. Next thing we got to get into. Um. It's been up in the air. People have been trying to make it more dramatic because he was on vacation and it didn't get signed. They didn't know what was going to happen. Jalen Brown was off vacation for one day and inked the deal. 
<laughs> he now has the richest contract in NBA history um, and signed his super max extension with the Boston Celtics, which is a five year, $304 million contract extension. Um, and it will be fully guaranteed with a trade kicker. Um, and there is no player option on the deal. So off the bat, I want to just know what your opinions are. Cause like every, anytime the most expensive contract gets dished out, it becomes polarizing because you're going to see a lot of people that are like, they had to do it. They had to, you know, just have to kind of pony up and like give out the money. There's a lot of people that are like, this is stupid. Why are we giving somebody that's not even the best player on his team 300 M's? So what do you, you think about this super max extension for Jalen Brown? I think that they had to do it. Um, I think that what, for all the people that saying, oh, I wouldn't have paid him. I would have just traded him. Traded him where? For what? Yeah. Him for for what? Like how trading him? What are you doing? Unless you're getting Damian Lillard, which is like still a very expensive contract for an older player. It's like you're not going to trade him and get the same value, especially when that team that's trading for him knows that they're going to have to pay him a huge contract. So it's like, no, his value isn't as high as a lot of people just think it is. And it's not as easy to just trade this guy like people think it's just as simple as like i'd have just traded him it's not that easy it's not that simple mm -hmm. and the fact that you traded for chris Stops, you gave him this two-year extension you're all in right now your goal is to win a championship you're all in so if you're all in why would it make sense to let go of Jalen brown that, that right. just doesn't make sense you have to pay him i understand it's a lot of money but that's just the way the NBA is right now, bro. The NBA is giving out a lot of bags, bro. The NBA, right. it, as the money is just flowing in. So I just feel like they had to, they had to pay Jalen Brown if they were still going to be a contending team. And I feel like they can, they can win a championship. Like I think a lot of people really just don't think that they can win with them, bro. They can win with that. that they team were can two win. wins away from beating the Warriors. Like if J if Jason Tatum plays better, they win. If Jason Tatum plays to Jason Tatum level, they win. And Jalen, no one wants to talk about how good Jalen Brown played in that series and in that whole playoff run. Bro right. was just coming off of a season where he was second team All NBA, averaging like twenty seven points a game. He's not bad. Like I get it, the left hand jokes are funny. He's not bad, bro. Right. And I think I think we would both agree if they didn't sleepwalk in the Eastern Conference Finals to start that series, like they should have been in the finals this year. Mm -hmm. And it, like, there's probably even an argument to be made if Jason Tatum don't roll his ankle in Game Seven. Who, who knows? knows? Like, obviously that's all what ifs, and like the Heat won that series, like they deserve that. But look, if the Celtics didn't come out and lay three goose eggs back to back to back in those first three games, they're probably in the finals against Denver. I don't know if they beat Denver, but like, that all goes back to your point of like, this is a championship level team. So getting rid of your second best player who has had been in trade rumors for basically every year now about if him and Jason Tatum can coexist, but they can play together. This should like this past season. And then obviously the finals run the year before that should be more than enough for you all to understand that the two of them are there. Like you need to capitalize on this window right now. That's what I think they're doing. Um, with the amount of money that they're dishing out. But realistically, this is going to be the case with every single, and it's been like this. Like, I don't, I don't know why people get so up in arms about the size of these contracts, because this is not going to be the biggest contract in NBA history for that long. It's not, bro. The money is just when his go teammate up goes up, up, Jason Tatum's extension is like 340 or 350, something crazy. Like, it's that's just the salary cap keeps getting bigger and it happens every single time there's a new CBA and there's, um, you know, the new TV money comes in. Like there's the first big extension that goes after that is always like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy overpay Bro, Mike Conley got $180 million on the Grizzlies um, without ever having made an all-star game. Yeah, bro. It's always like that. It's just the fact that it always it seems like that big that first big extension always goes to someone who's not like top five player in the league. So it's All like right. and then they put they, I hate when they always pull up like the 
Jalen Brown's making this, and this player's only making this, and this player's only making this. And it's like, bro, if that player was eligible for a contract extension right now, he'd be making three fifty, like you said. So right. people really need to just stop overreacting. And they act like they, they're giving this to a bum. He was second team all NBA. Right. Like they're not giving it to to like Dylan Brooks. Like they're giving it to somebody that's actually a, a one of the I I think top what, twenty to twenty five best players in the league. Like exactly. yes, he he's had a bad moments, but bro, he's also had great moments. Like last year's championship, he was the best player on the Celtics. If Jason Tatum plays to just Jason Tatum level, they win the championship. That's how I feel. Yeah. And like, who knows? They Jalen Brown could have been Finals MVP the way he was playing. Like he was playing great. And like back then, matter of fact, how do y'all go from this? This doesn't make sense to me. How do you go from? Jalen Brown needs his own team. He's better than Jason Tatum. Like, how do you go from that to don't he stinks? He doesn't have a left hand. He didn't have a left hand when y'all was saying when y'all was making that whole claim that he was better than Jason Tatum. He didn't have a left hand then. So it's like what 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 changed, bro? People need to learn to when you are evaluating players strictly on court, we've got to and I'm saying we is like really the media and fans as a whole Y'all got to learn to separate contracts from on-court play Mm -hmm. because like that was, I think, such a big reason why Russ was getting viewed the way that he did. And it's clear like he regressed, but he was getting viewed like it was like, bro, there was legitimate people acting like Russ couldn't play in the NBA anymore. Right. But it was because he's getting paid $40 million a year and wasn't playing up to nowhere near that level mm-hmm. but now because he on a three million dollar deal so oh my gosh we saw what he was doing with the clippers last year that's a steal right y'all need to remove contracts from how you're evaluating players like that's something to think about in terms of team construction like we're just solely looking at what a player can or can't do on the court how good they are and how they fit with the team i don't have nothing to do with how much they're getting paid and some of that is skewing how people really view players. And so there's going to be a lot of people now that are hyper, hyper critical of all of Jalen Brown's flaws, like you said, because he's making, I think the first year of this deal, he starts out making $52 million a year. And then in mm-hmm. the year 2028, he's making $69.1 million. So they're going to be so, so critical of every little thing he does wrong because he's getting almost $70 million a year. Bro, in the year 2028, this might not even be the top 10 biggest contract. It's probably not going to be, bro. Bro, the salary cap is going to go. I think it's it's basically they capped it now at 10% because of the KD year. Where it was like the salary cap jumped like 20-some percent, and that's how the Warriors are able to kind of finesse all them contracts at once. Mm-hmm. So they capped it at 10, so they don't have that ever happen again. But that means it's probably going to hit that 10% every single year. And the Supermax gives teams, I think you can go up to 35% of the cap. So it's like, bro, if the cap is growing 10% every year, bro, first of all, Jason Tatum's extension is off rip next year going to be bigger than this. Mm-hmm. Every other, like when Shea goes up for extension, it's going to be bigger because he's already made. Everybody that makes all NBA that's young and is going to be in their 20s and due for an extension is going to have a bigger contract than this. And yeah, act like you're going to like – by the time his contract's up, he's going to be a 38-year-old wash player. Like, bro, he's – how old is Jalen Brown? 26? Right. He's going to maybe just now be tapping 30 at that point. Like, bro, he's still – you're going to get a all-NBA caliber player alongside your top 10 all-NBA caliber player for the next five years. Y'all are going to compete at minimum, just compete for the next five years. That's the other thing, too. I think people got are getting too held up on the fact that Jalen Brown isn't the best player on the Celtics. So how is he making 300 M's? But it's like, he's not the best player on this team. He could go to a lot of teams and be the best player on that team. Mm-hmm. He's that good. But they just so happen to have drafted very well and have two very good wings on the team at the same time. Mm-hmm. So he shouldn't, he shouldn't get his bag because he's... He's not better than Jason Tatum. Like the the alternatives to them giving them giving him this extension are not good. You let him walk for nothing, which is like 
nightmare scenario or you trade him and now you run the risk of you again you already know that this is a team that can get to the finals and compete and like we're being honest should have two finals appearances by now thing you know a couple things fall their way injury wise you know even in that final series against the warriors tatum you know a whole playoffs that had the shoulder injury like they can be a little bit more healthy they might have a ring already and we th- this discussion probably don't even happen because it's it just like a no-brainer, but they already won a ring. They're still competing for rings. Like, you got to keep the core together. But because mm-hmm. they weren't able to do it, people are always going to have those question marks. But I think in both of our minds, they're there. They have the pieces. You have to compete now. And so, like I said, sometimes you have to pay more to keep your guys. In this contract, like I said, bro, in a couple years, this – like worst case scenario, they feel the need to have to bring it up. It'll be tradable because there will be other people making this kind of money. Mm-hmm. And like, what, like what? Well, so we're looking at like what, like fifty m's a year. We're seeing role players get like twenty. You could c- package a couple of role players together and make the money match, like for real. So it's you get people got to step out and look at the bigger picture of. With the Celtics situation, where the money is going in the league moving forward, how the new CBA works, and like all of those things considered, like the Celtics, I think, had to give him the money. I think it was the right thing to do for them moving forward. Yeah, and I just think people need to stop contradicting themselves because it's like, like I said before, Jalen Brown was just better than Jason Tatum in you guys' eyes. Now he stinks. Oh. Jason Tatum can't win a championship as the number one option. So if you really believe that, why letting go of the other all-NBA caliber player? Why would that make their chances to win a championship better? If you already think Jason Tatum can't win it as a number one, let's make his chances worse by removing the second best player on the team who's all-NBA. Like It's just everyone's saying that this is a problem and not coming up with a solution in their minds that would that can work or makes any sense. Like right. people, th- people think that like, oh, I'm gonna just trade him. Like people think that like just saying like I'm gonna trade him just instantly means like I I'm gonna trade him for another All NBA caliber player. Like that's just that's not right. how and, stuff and the, works. The, the fit's gonna be the fit's gonna work. Fit's gonna be perfect. Money gonna work. Right. Everything. They're just gonna click. Right. Like, whoever they trade for is never gonna want out. Right. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, bro, that's it's not how this is real life, bro. It's not 2K right. where you can just put stuff in it and like you can just trade people. It's not 2K. Right. You can't bro. just click Jalen Brown on a trade finder and look at all the different options. That's right. Not like, how pe- it really works. People have to be offering those players. Like, it's, right. it's not how that stuff works, bro. People need um, to stop overreacting. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, even all the, like, on the court stuff aside, look, bro, shout out to Jalen Brown. You just got. You got the bag of all bags. Respect. 300 M's is crazy. Almost $70 million for one NBA season is, that's crazy, bro. We're in our lifetime. We're going to see people get like five years, $500 million, make a hundred million dollars a year. That's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy to think about. I'm waiting for somebody to get that Mbappe money, that $700 million a year. All I know is, man, my future kid's going to have that soccer ball. That's mm-hmm. dainty because 700 M's is crazy. Bro, that's insane. Even the fact that it's like they ha- they would have to pay his team now like $350 million just to get him on the team. That's crazy. They bro. have too much money. I was they say, have that's too way much, that's too much, too much money. That's too much bread, bro. I'm sorry. Would you take that? Like, so like let's say you were like... I'm trying to think of somebody who's like peak of their powers right now. Like, all right, let's say you like you, Jason Tatum, you just now about to hit your prime. You got all the endorsements, everything. You in the league, you established, right? You up for extension next year. You got like a five year, $330 million deal. But this basketball team in Saudi Arabia called you. They said, bro, we could get you on a two year, <laughs> two year, $1 billion deal. Dog. <laughs> I will go play Afghanistan <laughs> for, for a billion dollars, bro. Like, I don't care where it's at, bro. Shit me to the Bermuda Triangle. I'll play in the middle of the ocean, bro. I don't care, bro. I will hoop for a billion dollars? Come on, bro. That's a lot of money, bro. Like, bro, that dude that's getting a billion dollars could call Jalen Brown broke. 
Crazy. Like, he could say, bro, he could say, bro, we, let's go like, 100, 100 M for 100 M right now. <laughs> right. And I bet you, you'll run out first. Like, what? He could really, he, if Mbappe took this deal, he could take all of Jalen Brown's five-year extension and throw it in the ocean and still have double that left over. <laughs> Honestly, bro, one person doesn't even need that. What do you even need that much you money? Don't, you don't. You bro, don't. Honestly, when you when you genuinely think about, like, really, really think about the concept of this, right? Let's just say, Jalen, bro, forget the seven. Th- that's a crazy amount, bro. It's like, bro, I'm gonna give you three hundred million dollars because you could make this basketball go into that basket over here. <laughs> and, <laughs> like, bro, that's such a crazy concept when you genuinely think about it, and because so many people want to watch you do that. Here's three hundred million dollars. Right. The whole time I got freaking doctors saving lives, and, and like nobody, oh nobody care. You ain't getting working, no working thirty six hours straight. Right. You ain't getting, you ain't getting three hundred M's, my boy. They I'm can't sorry. even get close going to, to seven s- figures. Going to school for a hundred years just to <laughs> just to come out, right. and you got that's, this guy, this guy that's hit the genetic lottery, and he's just three hundred M's. Like that's it's so crazy when you actually think about it. It really is, and like you said, like. It's pe- like people grinding to make like you want to make a six figure salary. It's like you just want to get to hundred k a year. Mm-hmm. It's too about to make off the rip fifty five million dollars in one year. What you about to you could make two hundred thousand dollars a year. It's a great salary. Mm-hmm. You your whole lifetime career earnings. You not even scratching the surface of one year for this contract. Damn man. And why can I be six six? You know, jump out the gym, athletic freak. Right. I don't even need to be that, bro. You could have just gave me like six two, six three. I'd have been all all hunger. All That's what I'm saying, bro. Honestly, like you give me two mil a year. You give me the vet minimum. I'm chilling. Like, I'm be cool. DJ Tucker. I'm cool, bro. I'm hustling, diving for loose balls. I'll be the enforcer on the team. I use all mm-hmm. five of the fouls. Right. I like, get teched up, ejected. Somebody try to go at my star player. I'll take a punch for you. Bro, whatever you need, bro. Just throw me. Right. Bro, you don't even got to throw me a bag, bro. Just throw me one M. <laughs> just mm-hmm. one M a year. I do it all. <sighs> it's crazy, bro. Basketball money is insane. Yeah. It's getting. It's really. That's the way. If you play in America, that's the way. Jalen Brown just got three hundred M's whole time. Saquon fighting for his life to get <laughs> to get ten he, mil. He took a nine hundred thousand dollar raise and say, "Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. I'll, I'm that's fine cool. with that." Let me go get into these multiple car crashes a week. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me carry the entire Giants offense on my back, and then get franchise tag next year. And have this guy who was nothing without me get paid forty M's a year. 40 M's not running backs, but they, but they really need to like make their rookie year, rookie deal, like two, two years. years. Yeah. Make it two years, bro. Cause that's the only way to solve it. But that's not going to be a problem. Cause that's, that's not going to change. The CBA don't change until like, I think it's like four years from now. Or it's no like way that. the owner's even giving that up. That's too, that's too smart. Mm, nah. Cause this, yeah. bro, that's the, this literally mm. is the loophole for team mm-hmm. building. You draft a good RB, run him into the ground. He's due for an extension. We're not signing you. We're about to draft another RB. Run him right. into the ground. <laughs> right. Just do it. Rinse, repeat every single time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is – that's crazy. But I'm trying to think who's the next – like, who's the next person that's up for an extension? Um, Honestly, I don't know. Let me see if I could find it. When Giannis is up. I feel like I Giannis is signed up his next a year. I feel like Giannis signed his a while ago. Oh, people! Oh, you can they can so you can already see based on projections what the next like extensions are going to be. So next year is going to be Giannis, and then I think well, that's, if he waits until next season, he could sign yo five year three thirty four. Then the next year it would be five year three sixty seven. The next year after that is five year four oh four. Jokic will be up for extension. D Book will be up for an extension. Shea will be up for an extension. <clears throat> ja, Zion, Darius Garland all up for an extension. 
Five year, four hundred and four million dollars, bro. On the last year of their contract, they'll be making ninety two million dollars a year. That's Tough. what I'm saying, bro. In a couple of years, we we're gonna look back on this Jalen Brown deal. It's like, yo, the Celtics really just saved. That was a steal. They just that saved us hundred million dollars. <laughs> oh my god, it's crazy, man. Jesus Christ. Um. Let's get into what little bit of the the off season rumors are out right now. Um, uh, before we get into the the NBA Award Association, I might, so I might not have time to do the word association. I got to leave in like like twenty minutes for this appointment. But well, honestly, then let's because this the rumors is dry. Copy. So let's go through the word association right now. Um, <clears throat> Oh, shoot. Uh, I just popped up on my screen, bro. Prayers up to Bronny and the whole James. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is yeah, a crazy about that. situation. Yeah, that was wild. That is a crazy situation. So Definitely it's good to hear that game. he's out of the ICU after the, you know, the cardiac arrest and he's mm-hmm. supposedly doing good. But bro, that is scary, scary stuff, bro. So prayers up to, to him and the whole family. Facts, bro. Um, But, yeah, so for the, the game today to wrap up the pod, we got some more word, word association. So we've done it before. So if you haven't seen it, I'm going to give Dame a word, and he's going to give me a player, present or, or past, um, he feels like fits that adjective. So I got, I think, six words here we're going to go through. Um, and I'm interested to hear some of these answers because I think I got some – I got a different set than last time. Tried to get a little bit more – a little bit more uh, unique um, mm-hmm. in some of these words. And speaking of unique, that's actually going to be the first word. So what's the first player that comes to mind when I say unique? Unique. The first player that comes to mind is Jokic, mm-hmm. just because his game is very unique. I mean, like it's yeah. just <laughs> like we've never really seen a big man. I mean, we've seen like we've seen some big man who has been great pastors like him and facilitate offenses a little bit, but not to the extent of a Jokic. So like where he's a center being the ball handler and pick and rolls, facilitating, running the whole offense. So I'd say I say definitely Jokic for unique. Okay. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. He's he is a uh, a man is one of a kind. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jokic honestly could fit into this next word too, but I'm not gonna let you use him. So you gotta pick somebody. <laughs> different. Um, next word I got is crafty. Austin Reeves. You know, what Austin saying? Reeves. That's just not. Nah, that's just the first name that came to my mind. You know, what I'm saying he. Be, you know, what I'm saying he's crafty around the rim. He's crafty with his is handles he crafty? a little bit. Or is he white? <laughs> <laughs> but he just has a high motor, high IQ, you know what I'm saying? Really grit and grind. But nah, I, I say, honestly, him, I think that was just on my mind because I had some Lakers on my screen. But it was him. But if I could pick another one, too, for crafty, the easy answer is, like, Kyrie. But that's just, like, that's so easy. I'm trying to think of someone that's. Yeah. Hmm. That's, like, crafty around the rim. Or not just around, but just crafty, just in general. Damn, the first person, yeah, it's just Kyrie. Really, is the first person that comes to mind. Like he's just like when I think of crafty, like it's just Kyrie. That's in my head right now. Every time I think of the word crafty, all European <clears throat> bigs pop in my head. So I'm thinking Dirk, Pau Gasol, Mark Gasol, Boris Diaw, <laughs> like, <laughs> just big dudes that be doing more than any other big dude. Right. Um. So next word I got for you is polarizing. I I think I've said Russell Westbrook before. Mm-hmm. Another polarizing player. Just because we were talking about him, Trey Young. That's that's where I that's like, where my head went to. Yeah, just because we were talking about it, like it's like it seems like now it's either you love him or hate him, mm-hmm. which is literally the definition of polariz- polarizing. So I I say Trey Young. Okay. Okay. Um. Next one I got is dominant. Shaq. That's just it's it's so it easy, bro. It's, it it's Shaq, bro. The most dominant player to ever play the game. Thirty plus points per game with no three attempts. A boy was shooting less than fifty percent from the free throw line. Literally dominant. Imagine bro. if he was just a a seventy five percent free throw shooter. Bro, he literally he bro, Shaq is like literally one of the greatest what ifs, bro. Like if this guy just like had the work ethic of Kobe, like, bro, Shaq w- could be the GOAT. Like, he literally could be up there. It's like one of, in that GOAT conversation, like the numbers, we were talking about numbers with like Jordan and like Curry and all them. 
if you go back and look at them early 2000s numbers, mm -hmm. r bro, it's ridiculous. Like, ridiculous. Even, like, just the, the, the numbers in, like, the playoff series that he was in, the games that he had. But his stats are, like, video game stats, bro. Right. It makes no sense. Like, no sense. The most telling thing when I think about Shaq for me is when somebody was interviewing Richard Jefferson about, um, asked him about Shaq. And he was like, what y'all really don't understand is Shaq changed the way that teams in the early 2000s had to be constructed. Facts. Like you had to hold like two or three extra roster spots at the bottom of your bench for just bigs, like just Literally. large bot, like not even good bigs. Yeah, obviously you don't even a have to be big. Good. Because mm -hmm. you need people that can foul out. <laughs> everybody is about to foul out because nobody can hang with him. So it's just like you just need bodies to throw at him. That's it's really like, crazy to think about, bro. Insane. Shaq got people jobs. Shaq literally got people in the NBA. Because them was, same guys. He was keeping seven footers with a paycheck. Because them same guys couldn't sniff a roster right now. Like, Absolutely not. At all. not. They wouldn't have sniffed a roster if he wasn't in the league. Yeah. So, oh. yeah. Can't can't ever go wrong. Shaq, in terms of dominance, the best ever. Uh, last two we got here. <laughs> uh, this is a funny one. I got the word obnoxious. Patrick Beverly, bro. It's really, <laughs> like, it's just pissing me off. Everything he does. Him, Dylan Brooks. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? I'm trying to think of somebody else. There. Chris Paul at times, even though I like Chris Paul. He just... Draymond. Them guys just piss me off sometimes. Like, those are the guys that, like, bro, you would love to play with them. But every time you play against them, like, it's annoying. Or when your team plays against them, it's just annoying, bro. I got a, a two-parter for this one. Two people on the same team. And this is – just hear me out. James Harden and Joel Embiid. Okay. And the same thing. On that Through the Wire episode, uh, Pierre brought it up. And I thought it <laughs> – I thought about it so many times watching the Sixers last year, and he's brought it up before, which is like, bro, watching both of them, like it be stretches of the game where it's just every possession is foul bait, foul bait, foul bait. Yeah. Joel and B getting guarded by a guard, hand on the hip, he on the ground. Yeah, I, like, yeah, I can see that. the flopping, the trying to get oh the fouls. Like, come gosh. on, the, bro. Like the both of y'all at the same time, game is moving at a snail's pace at the free throw line every single time. And it's not like, I mean, there are fouls, yes, but, like, y'all are an, but it, selling the contact. And to the watchers, like, you don't, I don't want to watch you foul, bait. That's no. not what I want to see. Because y'all could just score. Bait. Like, y'all can just score. I see y'all do mm -hmm. it. But it's like, getting to the line, I understand it. I get it from their perspective. But it is annoying to watch on a night-in, night-out basis, especially in the regular season where it's like, bro, just play, like, just play. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the last word I got, I, I put it as a hyphenated, so I'm going to count it as one word, is team player. Team player. Hmm. I'd say Kevin Love. Okay. Kyle Lowry. I'm trying to okay. think of guys, you know, guys, you know, they go out there, they take charges. Yeah. You know, they throw them outlet flashes. Like, they really selfless Blue out guys, there. Yeah. Blue guy. Udonis Haslam. You know what I'm I saying? Just, he might be I'm, a team coach. OD. <laughs> <laughs> Miami Heat legend right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, he's just like, I say Jokic too. Jokic's up there, but I'm not going to, I already said Jokic. Yeah. Because I was trying to think of like a, a superstar to put up there too. Rondo. Rondo was a really good team player. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'll say them guys right there. You know, what is that? Uh, Rondo has some crazy stat lines. Somebody just posted the the clips from it on Twitter recently, that Pelicans game. Yeah, he had 2.7 rebounds, 25 assists. That's crazy. It don't get more team player than that. <laughs> bro, it's not like he's trying to get the playmaking badges, bro, in 2K. <laughs> Straight pick and rolls and lobs. He ain't don't doing nothing up. else. Facts. Two points, twenty five assists. Bros accounted for still like minimally like fifty five points, and only yeah. scored two. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Rondo is a wow. good. That's a good poll. Um, but yeah, 
Well, next episode, we're going to be going through each position. So we're going to be going to shooting guards. I feel like shooting guard, small forward, and power forward are going to be weird to rank because, like I said, all these other positions, it's going to be even hard to, like, label guys as one thing because you got th- twos that be playing at three half the time. Especially when we get to forwards, it's like Tatum is – a small four, but he be playing a four. DeMarco right. Rosen sometimes be playing a four, and it's like they're not power forwards, but they're going to be labeled as power forwards. But so we're going to have to get aligned on. We have to just make like a player bank for all literally, of these lists, literally, so that we don't have random people popping up. But we're going to be going through all of these uh, positional rankings here. So stay tuned to the off the glass. It's going to do it for another episode. Um, I said, if you made it this far in the episode. We do appreciate it. If you're on YouTube, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. If you're on audio platforms, go ahead and pre-download the show and drop a five-star rating. Um, we appreciate the support. As always, be sure to follow the socials. That's at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. If you're going to any concerts, if you're going to any baseball games here over the next couple of days in the summertime, you know the weather's been good. If you're getting tickets through SeatGeek, be sure to use code Off The Glass. All one word gets you your $20 discount. Um, Show support to the podcast there as well. Um, But as always, I'm Billy. That's Dame. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.